You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up... The calm before the storm. Westminster braces for the local election results. Will they save Rishi Sunak or will they sink him? Act of conscience or cynical turncoat? As Conservative MP Dan Poulter switches to Labour, what does it take to cross the floor of the House of Commons? And should Parliament simply overturn the convictions of postmasters caught up in the Horizon scandal en masse? We talked to Chair of the House of Commons Justice Committee, Sir Bob Neill, about this and much more. But first, Ruth, let's get started on those local elections. Now, we're speaking in that kind of caesura, that missing of a beat period where the voters are out there voting, the politicians can't really say or do much more than get out their voters to the polling stations, and so all is quiet until the results come. And the results this time are going to be rather dragged out. The agony is extended, (laughs) you might say, because with all these big metro mayoralties, they will be counting votes into Saturday afternoon. So quite a long time for the results to unfold. There'll be good news and bad news for all the parties, doubtless, as the results dribble out. And uh, Rishi Sunak will then have to handle the political aftermath. But before we get on to that, both of us, I think, battled through the morning mist this morning to get to our respective polling stations. And the one thing you didn't have to battle was vast crowds of eager (laughs) voters trying to get in there. (laughs) We were the only people in our polling station, my other half and I, when we went in and glancing at the register, it looked like about 20 people had voted at about eight o'clock in the morning. So a pretty derisory turnout in my neck of the woods in Sussex, where the voting was purely on who's going to be the next police and crime commissioner. Well, same for me in uh, in East Hertfordshire. So we just got a vote on the police and crime commissioner as well. And I actually asked the polling station staff, what's the turnout like? And they said, oh, you're our sixth voter. And this was 8am. So I was the voter that put them over the top. They've officially now had more voters than polling station staff in the, <laughs> in the station. So it was slow, I think it's fair to say. They were hoping for better as the day wears on. But I don't know about you, I've had no literature, no leaflets. Not a sausage. No information information about who the candidates are, why they're running, what they're running for. No information really about what the Police and Crime Commissioner does, so I had to look it up all myself online to find out. We are, shall we say, very engaged voter. You know, we go to the trouble of looking it up and know where to look for it. If you're an average voter who's not that engaged in politics, why would you bother, frankly? Well, that's a question, and, and I think that somewhat hangs over the results of these elections, particularly for things like the Police and Crime Commissioners. If they are elected on an absolutely derisory turnout, how legitimate are they as political figures? And for Westminster, as MPs and politicos ponder the results of these elections, how much can they tell from elections with very, very low turnouts, where the people who do vote are mostly the hyper-engaged end of the spectrum. Mm. I mean, we always know local election turnouts are much lower than general elections, and I suppose our seats are unusual in that they haven't got actual local elections for the council or mayoral elections. You'll get a better sense of what's happening in those seats than you, you will in ours. Well, the mayoral elections, I think, will be certainly a bit livelier because there are big local names, mm. big local personalities, the, the Ben <laughs> Houchens, the Andy Burnhams, people like that, who are in the local headlines rather a lot. There's some new mayoralties as well in places like North Yorkshire and the East Midlands, and voters will have a whole new political structure to get involved with and learn how to understand and operate Mm. over time. So interesting questions to look at there. But the key thing, of course, is the feedback that will come into Westminster about Rishi Sunak's own leadership. And as I say, we're speaking before the polls have even closed, but there's no doubt that a lot of Westminster is bracing itself for a potential leadership challenge to Rishi Sunak if the results are really, really bad. And just this morning, an opinion poll put the Conservatives a whole 26 points behind Labour. They were on 18%, Labour were on 44%, and actually even more alarming for the Conservatives, the Reform Party was only three points behind them on 15%. And so 
essentially the comparison that will be going on in the minds of conservative MPs and party activists is do these results stand up those kind of opinion polls or do they contradict them? Mm. If they contradict them, if the Conservatives are doing much better than that on the ground in actual results and actual votes, then Rishi Sunak may be able to breathe a sigh of relief and be able to tell people that the fight back has started Mm. and he is gaining traction. But if those results more or less confirm those opinion polls, well, what then? Mm. There's three factors in there to bear in mind. We've talked about turnout is is an unknown factor, but it will be lower than a general election. So it will only tell you so much. You've got to look at the swing, the size of the swing, you know, from Conservatives to the Labour Party, from Conservatives to Reform and so on. But of course, one of the factors then to bear in mind, the third factor is that Reform is only standing, I think, something like one in six seats. Mm -hmm. So it's not running a full ground operation across the country in all these elections. So you wouldn't expect, therefore, that it to be performing in line with its polling numbers. Well, it's national share will, will be distorted by by yeah. that factor. But there is a question about reform, which is the extent to which it's a political party or is it a platform? Is it a platform for Nigel Farage and a kind of vehicle that provides the logo on the podium from which he speaks? Or are there lots of reform activists out there running lively local campaigns, conducting get-out-the-vote operations, contesting local Mm. elections vigorously in a large chunk of the country. And that's a big test for them. Is this an actual all-singing, all-dancing political party in the sense that most of the others are? Yeah. Well, I don't think they are for the local elections. The question is, can they get themselves scaled up for a general election for all 600 seats, whatever it will be? And... The question I think that was going to arise in the next couple of weeks, what is Nigel Farage going to do? That is going to be in the heads of Conservative MPs. My assumption has been to this point that he probably doesn't want to run again in a constituency because he's run, was it six, seven times and lost every time? He doesn't want to go down to defeat again. On the other hand, the temptation to bury the Conservative Party, as he sees it, may be too great to resist. So he might come back. But on the other hand, you know, he's earning a lot of money You've outside. You've got a lot of hands here. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's earning a lot of money outside, you know, doing his, his broadcasting and so on. I've kind of assumed he's going to want to go off to the States and sort of campaign with Donald Trump. Is, is he really actually going to want to stay in, in England and, and campaign on the ground for reform? Well, in, it's a measure of election. Nigel Farage's achievement that everybody's yeah. talking about him and what's he going to do, more or less regardless of what kind of organisation there is there for him to pick up in in the shape of the Reform Party. But I do wonder whether his dance of the seven veils he's been performing, (laughs) where will he, won't he, drop a little hint here, drop a little hint there about what he's going to do, actually reflects genuine personal indecision, or whether it's a publicity maximisation strategy, just release little hints every now and then for people to get terribly excited about and generate the aura of a leader-in-waiting coming yeah. down from Mount Olympus to lead us. Yeah, wind everybody up and then... <laughs> um, it's a bit yeah. of a letdown if he doesn't, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, I mean, it can go too far, can't he, with it? I think a lot is going to depend over the next few days. Obviously, as you said, the results are coming out over a period of sort of Friday, Saturday and and into Sunday, some of them, apparently. We don't have this big result on a sort of Friday morning after the poll because not everybody is counting through the night as they they used to. General elections, you do have to count through the night because you have to start counting within a couple of hours of Mm. the polls closing. But for local elections, I think especially if the local councils are cash strapped and don't want to pay Mm. oodles of overtime, they can basically hold their count in office hours. Yeah. So the Conservatives have sort of been arguing that good results are if if Ben Houchin holds on to the mayoralty in Tees Valley, if uh, Andy Street holds on in the the West Midlands. Well, we're not going to know the Tees Valley result probably until Friday lunchtime is the best estimates. And that's the first big one. That's the first big one. And then Saturday lunchtime for the West Midlands. So before that, we'll obviously have got a lot of local council and police and crime commissioner results out by then. So it will be interesting how they manage the communications of this over the course of a long weekend. Indeed. And the other thing you've got to look at is, is of course, the, the magic word, the swing. Yeah. Ben Houchin polled, I think, 71% the last time the Tees Valley mayoralty was fought. So he could hold on and still see a massive swing against him, which would not be good news for Conservative MPs within the Tees Valley region, even if he was still there. Yeah. 
And that's the critical point. They may hang on by a hair's breadth to some of these seats, but as you say, if the swing against them has been very, very significant, that's the kind of swing that's going to take away a lot of those red wall seats come the general election. And remember that the presentation of results is almost as strategized as the elections mm. themselves. I'm sufficiently long in the tooth to remember back in the 1990s was when Ken Baker was the Tory chair. Former chair of the Hansel Society. Oh, indeed. Mm. And um, it looked like the Conservatives were going to take a terrible drubbing in a set of local elections and he managed to focus attention on the results in Bradford and Wandsworth and (laughs) Westminster. And when the Conservatives held all those, they were then able to say, look, this is a triumph, when in fact they they took a terrible drubbing across the rest of the country. Well, that seems to be what the Conservatives are doing, you know, focusing it on these two mayoralties. If we save these two seats, this is a big result for the Conservative Party. The problem, I think, with that is, of course, those two mayors are quite independently minded. They've got big independent profiles, both separate to their party and separate to their party leader so I'm not sure really what it does tell you actually it tells you that actually being separate to different to standing apart from your party presenting yourself as a more independently minded individual is beneficial it's the mayoralties where people haven't got that profile and which are more therefore in tune with the party position that perhaps tell you really more accurate sense of, of, of how the party's perceived by the electorate. Well, a couple of strands in that, really. First of all, the mayorities, I think, when they were originally conceived, were always supposed to be a bit like yeah. that, non-party figures, or at least more independent figures. So they weren't necessarily automatically, robotically towing the party line. And these were a product of the coalition years, weren't they, in sort of 2010? All oh, these the local devolution deals that, yeah. that the, the government was setting up. But the second thing is, of course, that if, if you are running as someone who's distant from the government, don't blame me for that lot in Westminster then it's quite hard for that lot in Westminster, although they'll doubtless try, to take it as a vindication that that person has survived. I mean, lots of tales of Conservative councillors at a much more local level trying to distance themselves from the National Party. I mean, one of the things you can follow on social media is people putting out images of local leaflets, literature that the parties have been putting out. And we said, we've not had any in our area, but the Swanage Conservatives put out a a sort of a, a, a leaflet stroke letter And it says, putting it mildly, Swanage Conservatives have become just as angry, upset and frustrated as so many members of the public at aspects of government conduct and the behaviour of MPs of our own party who've brought the party into disrepute. But whatever we do here, however much we work, we cannot affect these things. And naturally, we don't feel we should be held responsible for what goes on and around Westminster. So we hope you will not use these important local elections to make a token gesture against the government and, wait for it, our squalidly behaving MPs, because the only effects of that will be felt here on our work for Swanage and Dorset. Um, There's lots and lots of examples where local parties are putting out literature which haven't got party logos on, not in the party branded collars, no images of prominent senior party members, Rishi Sunak and members of the cabinet, really trying to disassociate themselves with the National Party. And I have some sympathy actually with that whole idea because actually you're voting for local councillors so maybe you should look at the performance of the local council. You're voting for police and crime commissioners, look at the performance of the police and crime commissioners. But nine times out of ten a vote that's cast in a local election is cast on national party lines and driven by national political angst. So uh, that's showbiz I'm afraid. Well, talking of political angst, shall we talk about Daniel Poulter, MP, yeah. across the floor of the House of Commons this week? Dr Dan, a Conservative <laughs> MP in Suffolk since 2010, before that a Conservative councillor in two different authorities. He served as a councillor in Hastings and then in Rygate in Surrey, and now has crossed the floor of the House, as the technical term has it, to become a Labour MP, on the basis that, as a doctor, he's become increasingly distressed about the state of the NHS, and said that he couldn't look his NHS colleagues in the eye because of what the government was doing to the NHS. Of course, this is absolutely exactly what Sir Keir Starmer wanted Mm. to be able to say, and he's had great fun saying it, and he's had great fun taking this as a vindication of his party's position. But it's one of those things that I I think people outside politics don't necessarily understand what a big step it is to change Mm. parties. It's a huge thing for someone who's been kind of marinated in one political party or another for probably decades to simply shrug that off and go and work with people that you've previously been condemning and treating as the enemy and denouncing in public statements. Of course, Rishi Sunak had a bit of fun digging up some statements from Dan Poulter attacking the Labour Party that Mm. were really quite recent. So it is quite a big deal to switch colours like that. 
because suddenly all your mates are no longer your mates and are probably sort of cutting you dead in the corridors and he's been, denouncing you. He's been dumped you. from the WhatsApp groups. Uh, yeah, yeah, dumped <laughs> from the WhatsApp groups. And people start wondering how long ago you took the decision and have you been a sort of sleeper yeah. agent, gauging the mood of the party, passing intelligence to the other mm. side, all that kind of thing. It's in, in, inevitably a pretty uncomfortable experience and you're probably treated with a certain level of suspicion by your new colleagues as well because not that long ago you were the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's that sense of, of betrayal on the one hand, that sort of the breaking of those bonds of trust with your local constituency party, with your whip All in Parliament. All the people who worked for you at the last election are thinking, yeah. what did I do that for? And, and Dan Polt has been an MP since, what, 2010? So he's not a newbie who's just come into Parliament in a couple of years. He's, he's been in the House for a good few elections. He's been a minister. And... You can understand the sense of betrayal that his local constituency party would have. But on the other hand, you know, you can also appreciate that from his perspective, it feels like the party that he joined has changed from under him. And that's quite an interesting syndrome that you've got to think about here, because it's become increasingly common. This is not the party I joined Mm. is something that you could have said as a Labour MP under Jeremy Corbyn. And quite a number of them did and went off to form the independent group, that short lived breakaway party, the Tiggers. You could uh, say it as a Conservative MP if you feel that the Conservative Party has shed its previous pro-European credentials that it had with David Cameron and earlier leaders. You could say it as a Republican regular of the kind of George Bush mould now that Donald Trump's taken over that party. Mm. What do you do when your party is suddenly not the same organisation you thought you'd joined? Yeah, quite. Um, I actually looked up the numbers for MPs who've changed party allegiance. And as ever, the House of Commons Library has done the research so that I don't have to. Since 1979, apparently 204 MPs have changed their allegiance. Quite right a total. There. Yeah, so that encompasses all those who sort of left Labour for the SDP, who left the SDP for the Liberal Democrats. As you say, the Tiggers. Uh, it includes Conservative MPs who left for UKIP. Yeah, I wonder if that's individual MPs, because um, some of the people who joined the independent group, for example, ultimately ended up in the Lib Dems. Mm. So do they account for two I mean, changes? Ratting and, <laughs> ratting and ratting again, yes. That's yes, right. I must rat, rat and rat again <laughs> to save the party I love. I worked for Churchill, so... <laughs> but it is still a quite impressive total. And it's also quite a bad sign for the party that people are leaving. I mean, remember at one point in uh, the 2000s, there was a rash of Conservative MPs joining the Labour Party. Alan Howarth, who mm. was, became a Labour MP for a Welsh mining seat, and then uh, a Labour peer. You had Peter Temple, Morris, Quentin Davis, people Sean like Woodward. that. Yeah. Sean Woodward, Robert Jackson. Uh, so there's a whole load of people who switch parties for one reason or another. And it does kind of reflect a certain level of disintegration. There's a strong sort of late period John Major vibe about mm. some of this. Mm. Well, look, that's why there's been speculation, you know, has he been promised something? You know, yeah. is, is there an inducement to cross the House? Is there an inducement for, you know, your political career in the Commons may be over? He said he's standing down at the general election, but has he been promised something like a peerage? Well, he's standing we'll down from his, his seat in Suffolk. Is he going to suddenly pop up in, in, in you know, the Welsh Valleys in a traditional mining seat where some veteran is standing down? Mm. Or is he going Parachute to be the, the Lord Poulter shortly <laughs> after the next election? We don't know. And it's and they're know, not saying. And they're not <laughs> obvious reasons. And they're not saying. I think one of the things that people outside Westminster are a lot more squeamish about is the kind of promises and deals that are made behind the scenes in Westminster around this sort of thing. And there was a story floating around last week that at one point Nigel Farage had been promised several peerages for UKIP if he stood down in favour of the Conservatives. Mm. And you know, frankly, that's flatly illegal under the Lloyd George era legislation about trading in peerages. Yeah, quite. Well, shall we move on to a theme that we've picked up a number of times in the podcast, the quality of legislation, or lack thereof, and the way in which the government, not successive governments, but but recent governments in particular, have been ramming through late changes to legislation and the implications of that, because we've had a couple of interesting examples in the last week. Yes, the Renters' Reform Bill was back in the Commons for detailed consideration a couple of weeks ago, and um, vast amounts of amendments were dropped in on top of this in quite a short period of debate and this kind of mid-air rewriting of legislation is one of the things that seems to be happening with increasing frequency at the moment. In this case it was largely about watering down the removal of no-fault evictions which is a highly controversial subject. It's a long-standing government promise to change the law so it wasn't so easy for landlords to evict their tenants. 
but at the same time it raises all sorts of problems, not least, and this is something we'll probably be talking to Sir Bob Neill about a bit later on, that if you're not going to have a no-fault evictions process, you may be having to send an awful lot of eviction proceedings through the civil courts, which are already buckling under the caseload that they face. So there's a serious issue there. So what we had is for the the bill, 36, 36 new government clauses at the report stage. So just to flesh that out, the principles of the bill are dealt with at second reading. It then goes to a committee of MPs to consider, I mean, we talk about it as line by line scrutiny. It isn't line by line, but it's it's the more detailed scrutiny. It's the polite by fiction, yes. you might say, to call it line by but line it's scrutiny. it's the more detailed level. You discuss the principles of the bill at second reading, you get down into the operational detail and nitty gritty of the, the clause by clause text at, at committee. Committee proposes amendments. It then goes, it's, they report back to the House house you then have a report stage where they consider amendments so you're kind of on to the third round at this point Mm. of scrutiny and the government comes forward with 36 new clauses now some of that may arise out of the committee stage where they think actually we do need to to address that we need to to make some changes to the text and here's our proposals but 36 it's a lot to be debated in a day plus that's before you get to any amendments that the opposition parties want to propose or or indeed government backbenchers because there were quite a lot of those as well and uh, it's the sort of thing that if it were happening in the house of lords first of all there'd be a row yeah and people in the house of lords would say this is no way to run a chip shop secondly the house of lords would spend two or three days of committee stage consideration of that number of amendments and then a day of report stage consideration so there would be a much more thorough processing of what the government was offering up than you get in the house of commons and this all comes back to i'm afraid the dirty little secret of the house of commons which is that it is not that great as a legislative chamber, and I'm being very polite. Well, I, I won't name the MP, but she's quite a senior MP who's been in the House for many years. I suggested this week in a meeting that I thought MPs were largely abdicating their responsibilities in the legislative scrutiny process. I think it's fair to say she didn't really agree and didn't like it, but I stand by the comment. This is you know, a good example of what's going on. I mean, 36 of these clauses, they were all on different aspects of the bill, and yet they were all grouped together for debate and amendment all at the same time. I mean, yeah. in, back in the day, you would have had, you know, even just a few years ago, you would have had some kind of, of selection of those amendments into groups, and you'd have had more focused debate yeah, the of those themes. debates on each section yeah. of that. Yeah, but when you've got, you know, your one day of debate at report stage, it all gets jammed in together, and consequently you get a completely unfocused debate. And plenty of stuff just drops off the end and is never really talked yeah. about at all in the House yeah. of Commons, and then the House of Lords basically has to follow the, the Commons around with bucket and spade, sorting out pen. <laughs> so afterwards, you know, yeah. which is just not the way laws should really be no. written. You, you'd hope for better. No. And it's not the only example of odd things happening in legislation this week. We have the tobacco and vapes bill currently before one of those public bill committees where the line by line scrutiny doesn't actually take place, but yeah. we all pretend it does. And public bill committees can now take witnesses. So when you're investigating the workings of the bill, you can call in interested parties to explain how such and such a clause is going to affect them. So it's a slightly more focused than a select Mm. committee hearing, for example. But on this occasion, there was a peculiarity. Yeah, so when we looked at this, I mean, the the whips and the, the, the committee members decide who they want to call. And they call people who are going to, as they see it, make the arguments that are constructive and and in favour of the case they want to make, whether they're in opposition or in government. So it's a more politicised and tribal process than it is for appearing before a select committee. For example, when Hansel Society staff have been asked to appear before a public bill committee to talk about delegated powers, it's not been unknown for somebody from the WHIP's office to call and try and find out what it is you're going to say or to make some helpful suggestions about what they'd like you to say (laughs) to which we offer a straight bat and say we put out a briefing paper that's what we're going to say and we're not engaging in discussion any further but for the tobacco and vapes bill they've called 34 witnesses to give evidence but the interesting fact there was that none of them are from the tobacco or vaping sector so the people who who are really raising concerns about the bill, very practical concerns, of course they've got a big vested interest, but they, they're raising some practical concerns. None of them, and nobody it seems either from the consumer organisations, so there's plenty of public health officials, health and medical professions, trading standards and so on, but not from the retail sector. And just to remind people, the tobacco and vapes bill is essentially going to stop 
young people from smoking by progressively raising the age at which it is legal to buy mm. both tobacco products and vaping mm. products. And uh, that's a pretty big deal, you'd have thought, for the industry. So it's quite yeah. remarkable that the industry uh, isn't invited. Yeah, and, and the reason for that, one assumes, is that because... Actually, on this bill, the government and the opposition broadly agree. The opposition is, you know, broadly supportive of what the government's trying to achieve, and therefore isn't sort of bringing in people who are opponents of the bill or raising big questions about it. So, you know, unusually, you've got this kind of un- unbalanced, I think, set of evidence sessions. And this is, of course, be it remembered, the the personal project to some extent of Rishi mm. Sunak, who thinks that getting rid of smoking in a couple of generations' time is well worth doing, and so brought in this legislation, but which an awful lot of his troops actually don't like. They're not instinctive banners of things Mm. on health grounds. And I suspect that it'll be one of the selling points of any rival candidate who challenges Rishi Sunak for the leadership after these local elections, if that happens, that one of the things they'll promise to do is scrap this bill. Yeah, and he hopes for it to be one of his legacy issues, I think, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, But talking of um, retail industry witnesses not being invited to come in and give evidence, we've got another example on the Select Committee corridor where retailers were invited to give evidence. Fifteen retailers were invited in to give evidence to the Environmental Audit Committee for their inquiry into sustainability of the fashion industry, and they've all declined. And there's some big high street names on this list. John Lewis, Marks and Spencers, Sainsbury's, Tesco's. So they're not turning up. Yeah, this is an issue that the Environmental Audit Committee, which is the kind of green watchdog, if you like, within the parliamentary system, has been looking at for quite a while now. Mm. Back before the 2019 election, it was chaired by a Labour MP called Mary Cray, and she was extremely keen on taking a look at the the environmental cost of disposable fashion, throwaway Mm. clothes. I think the industry had quite a bruising encounter with the committee on that occasion, so maybe that's one reason why they're not coming. But it does highlight another one of the irritants about the working of Parliament, which is that actually Parliament doesn't have a workable system to compel witnesses to appear before its committees. It's not just the Dominic Cummingses of the sort of high awkward squad who cannot be compelled to appear before parliamentary committees. It's whole industries can just yeah. decide, shrug, we don't, we don't want to engage with this, and there's no comeback. Yeah. The chair of the committee, Philip Dunn, said that uh, he was disappointed. I, I think that's a pretty poor performance, he said, and I think, well, I think that's probably an understatement. <laughs> I mean, once upon a time, Parliament could send the sergeant-at-arms out to grab someone off the street uh, <laughs> and bring them into Parliament, and if necessary, sling them into a cell in yeah. Parliament until they were willing to uh, do what Parliament wanted. But those days are gone. There, there's no police powers now for parliamentary officials to go out and feel someone's collar. And if they were to try to do it, I imagine a a horrible legal tangle would follow. So that just doesn't happen anymore. There isn't a subpoena system where they can require people to appear in the way that the US Congress has. And there is a sort of ongoing rumbling debate about, really, shouldn't we have some kind of power to compel people? Mm. I mean, there have been various occasions when people from big multinational companies have shrugged and refused to appear before the business committee, and that's been a huge irritant. There was, of course, the Dominic Cummings case, mm. where he refused to appear at one point to talk about uh, his role in the Vote Leave campaign and the use of data by that campaign, and a whole load of other things, in front of Damien Collins's Culture, Media and Sport Committee, as it then was. Yeah. Dominic Cummings, of course, did did later turn up to the Health Committee to give evidence about the whole uh, situation regarding COVID. But that's part of the problem. You know, on the one hand, the House Commons is snubbed by the witnesses when it suits them. When they've got something they really want to say and they they want to make their case, they're happy to turn up and Parliament's apparently happy to, to take them. So difficult. Interesting thing did happen just by way of an amusing aside. Interesting thing did happen in the House of Lords this week. We had two tied votes in a day. <laughs> two tied votes in a day. And that's that sort of, of course, means that uh, the proposition you're voting on doesn't get passed. It's not like the Commons where the Speaker has a casting vote and will always use it in favour of the status quo. If if there isn't an actual majority for something in the House of Lords, it falls, even if it's got as many votes for it as against. Mm. So we had two votes in the Victims and Prisoners Bill, and a good turnout. I mean, there's something like 408 peers voted on one division and about 
440 odd on on the second so peers had turned out but yes two tied votes and of course this is not something we see in the commons very often because the government's got an inbuilt majority and whipping is you know three line whips on tight votes uh, are the norm but in the lords it's something that you see not frequently but more regularly so it's actually the third tied vote this year And that does suggest, though, that Conservative peers, when they want to, can turn out to vote with the government in a way that they just weren't turning out during the Rwanda bill. It highlights something about the nature of the Conservative Party's block vote in the House of Lords at the moment. Yeah. Well, Mark, with that, shall we just have a short break and we'll be back in a moment? 80 years ago, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee, sitting together in the House of Commons smoking room, paid a £1 subscription and so became the first members of the Hansard Society. The challenges facing our democracy are different to those that motivated them to help found the society in 1944, but they are just as urgent. So to mark this important milestone, we're launching the Churchill Attlee Democracy Lecture, and we're delighted that former Prime Minister Theresa May has agreed to give the inaugural speech on Tuesday 14th of May. She'll reflect on her life in Parliament, drawing on the unparalleled insights she's gleaned during her time as Prime Minister and as a backbench MP. With a wealth of experience in the corridors of Westminster, her lecture will explore what's wrong with Parliament and why and how it must change. So why not join us as we honour the legacies of our first members, Churchill and Attlee, with what promises to be a thought-provoking exploration of the challenges facing Parliament in the years ahead. Go to the Hansard Society website, hansardsociety.org.uk, and book your ticket now. That's hansardsociety.org.uk. So, Ruth, we're back, and in a few moments we're going to be talking to Sir Bob Neill, the Conservative former minister who now chairs the Justice Select Committee about, uh, well, the whole work of his committee and all the various different issues that are on its agenda. But one of the issues fairly close to the top of that agenda is the new legislation dealing with the aftermath of the Post Office Horizon scandal, Mm. the attempt to exonerate as a block all the sub-postmasters who were convicted on the basis of evidence from the Horizon accounting system that turned out not to work and turned out to be convicting people falsely. And the idea there is that if you don't approach this almost as a job lot... There are going to be people waiting an awful long time for their individual case to grind its way through the courts, and the only feasible way to do the job in any decent length of time is to have a kind of mass exoneration of the sub-postmasters. And and this, you would have thought, would be quite an easy business, but there are all sorts of constitutional issues here. First of all, should Parliament be doing this sort of thing rather than the process going through the courts, even if it does grind exceeding slow? And second, Parliament isn't doing it for all of the United Kingdom, Mm. and in particular it's not doing it for Scotland, and that provoked uh, quite a lot of emotion when that was discussed in the House of Commons. Yeah, there was quite a lengthy debate at the beginning because the government had a motion to extend the scope of the bill so that it covers the postmasters in Northern Ireland, but it's declining to do so for those in Scotland. And that lit the blue touch paper with the SNP, who were pretty annoyed. Now, this reveals quite an interesting constitutional bit of friction here because, oddly, the Scottish National Party is asking the UK government and the Westminster Parliament to legislate on behalf of an issue affecting people in Scotland rather than the Scottish Parliament. And the UK government in Whitehall is saying, no, you in in Edinburgh, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish government should take responsibility for this and legislate for it. And it's usually the other way round. Mm. The SNP frequently complains that the Westminster Parliament should keep out of Scottish affairs and is legislating where it's really the business of the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. But this time the, the roles seem to be reversed and that's because there doesn't seem to be total unanimity in Scotland about whether this is the right thing to do. The Lord Advocate for Scotland, the head of the separate Scottish legal system, has queried whether this is a, a appropriate in the context of the way the Scottish system works. Well, actually, the First Minister, I mean, Hamza Youssef, before he steps down, he'd indicated some concern about it. But the Scottish Lord Advocate, who's appointed by essentially the Scottish Government, nominated by the Scottish Government, approved by the Scottish Parliament, um, Dorothy Bain Casey, she's expressed concern 
because of the differences in the Scottish legal system and the different approach to prosecutions that they have, they put much more weight on corroborative evidence in their cases. And their argument was that mass exoneration was not appropriate in Scotland. Now, the government... So argument in London is that whereas in Northern Ireland there is unanimity in the political and legal community that whilst nobody is happy with mass overturning of convictions by Parliament instead of the courts, everybody accepts that it's a pragmatic, speedy solution. That consensus does not exist in Scotland. There's clearly bigger qualms in the, in the legal community and amongst the politicians. And hence London's view is, in light of that, over to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, bring forward your own bill, get it through the Parliament as quickly as you can and deal with it yourselves. But the SNP in Westminster is not happy about that. Well, indeed, Marion Fellows, who you could say is the SNP's equivalent of James Arbuthnot or Kevin mm. Jones, the MPs and other parties who've pursued this issue, was pretty upset when it was debated in the Chamber. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see what the Scottish Parliament does now. The Scottish Government presumably will have to be working up a bill as quickly as possible and, and, and lay it before the Parliament to get on with it. And it's not like they don't have other distractions right now. Not quite. <laughs> well, over to Sir Bob Neil. So welcome to the pod, Sir Bob. Can we start on this Horizon Bill? You've got some misgivings, I think, about whether a blanket exoneration is the right way to go. I have, yes. I think... Um as you probably know, Ruth, our, our select committee had a hearing about it with um, four I think, very distinguished witnesses, three serious academics and Joshua Rosenberg, I think, is a mm-hmm. you know, fantastic legal journalist. I think the consensus was that it was the least worst way of doing it, was, I think, the phrase that was used. And I sort of accept that, but that doesn't stop me having misgivings. And it's really this. I totally get the fact that the gro- a gross injustice was done to, to these people, mm-hmm. and we need to get that sorted out as swiftly as we can. But my concern is the constitutional precedent of Parliament interfering in what are, in fact, individual decisions of the courts. It isn't like changing the law as a matter of policy, you Mm -hmm. might say, post the Rwanda Supreme Court judgment, for example, or something that kind. It's effectively saying that the number of individual cases which result in convictions by the courts should be overturned without reference back to the courts. I think as a lawyer, that just makes me wary. There may be no other practical option in the time scale available, but I do think we've really, really got to emphasise the exceptional nature of this, because you certainly don't want that becoming any kind of precedent. And the government's argument is precisely that. Nobody's happy with this, but this is a pragmatic, speedy response. What's the alternative if it were to go through the courts? Uh, The Lady Chief Justice, when she gave a judgment, actually, in a a, a Horizon-related appeal, made it quite clear, as she did to our select committee, that she believes it could be done very quickly, by July with cooperation. What would be required would be, of course, for the prosecution to offer no evidence. Now, a route that uh, some of us have suggested will be, firstly, you have to get the Crown Prosecution Service to take over the prosecutions. That shouldn't be too difficult. The government is, after all, the sole shareholder in the post Mm. office. They could direct the post office to say, look, you should surrender any interest in these. In fact, they've already said they won't do further prosecutions. Wouldn't be too difficult for the attorney to speak to the DPP and say, look, please give this top priority. Maybe that might require a little bit more money. Uh, and I almost think if you, if you look at uh, the state of the evidence now, post Wynne Williams, he might conclude he can't say these convictions are safe, any of them. And then the Court of Appeal could list them in bulk. And then it could just be job done a few yeah. moments later and uh, and yeah. you wouldn't have had to have legislated in this very difficult area. That would still have been my preference. I think there was a bit of desire on both front benches for a bit of political machismo almost to say, look, we politicians have seized this uh, and got it done. And I can understand it because the more serious point perhaps is there is a concern that some of the people are quite elderly and frail now. Mm-hmm. How, how long... Uh, will, will they be with us, one he hates to say it. Secondly, it's a prerequisite of the compensation scheme to have the convictions quashed. Well, that might not be necessary if we thought about that. The more difficult point, which I think is, is perhaps the best bit in the government's favour, is that in some cases the evidence files are no longer available. There's also the issue that at the moment our criminal appeal procedure puts the onus on the defendant. That works when people are engaged uh, and are willing to do so. That works if the Criminal Cases Review Commission has reviewed their cases. Um, in some cases that has happened, in some cases it hasn't. But if there's nothing, no evidence to review, then you do have a problem. Or if there are people who are just so disillusioned and destroyed by the process 
uh, that, that they don't want to go anywhere near us at the moment. Yeah. That creates your problem. So that's why I do see the government side. But I, I said like the evidence files are no longer available. What's happened to them? In some cases, I think the evidence that the inquiry was that the post office had destroyed them. That may simply be a document retention policy. I hope it's simply that. Classically cock up rather than conspiracy, if I'm allowed to say that on the podcast. Yeah. Um, uh, rather than worse. Pop, but, um, but where the post office is concerned, I'm not sure whether well, that yeah, applies to Well, moment. I'm afraid you, yeah. would, you would worry because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are yeah. lots of other ramifications. But we are where we are now. The good news was, for what it's worth, the government moved quite a th- an important amendment at report stage in the Commons this week which was to say that uh, the provisions wouldn't apply to any convictions after the Act comes into force. And that's stating the obvious, but it's probably necessary to state the obvious, because I was suggesting a sunset clause. Mm -hmm. This does something similar. So once this unique set of events is dealt with, then it really shouldn't have any further effect as a piece of legislation. And as I understand it, once the bill gets royal assent, then pretty much immediately the convictions are quashed. Yes, the the convictions are quashed upon the uh, Act coming into force. But there's a few other practical things that have to be done. Firstly, a bill requires the Secretary of State to notify all those persons that they're aware of uh, Mm. that their conviction has been quashed. Suppose you want to uh, apply for a job. Suppose you want to go to the States. You know, you need to be able to have something which you can show when you fill in the form saying you don't have a conviction or if you had a conviction it was quashed. So that has to be done. And if they can't trace the people, they have to take reasonable steps to try and notify, for example, their next of kin if they died, or another authority if they can't find them, which probably, we understand, will be things like the Criminal Records Office to try and make it expunged. So there will be things that have to be done after that. And how big a player in all this has your Justice Committee been? Obviously it's been the Business Committee that was doing a lot of the probing around the original facts of of the Horizon scandal, but when it comes to the legal handling of it, how much influence and leverage has, has your merry band managed to have on this? Well, I, I was pleased that the transcript of our evidence session was referred to mm. quite often in, right. in the course uh, of the committee stage, actually, uh, of the bill. I think that had an influence. Um, I hope that it, it may be causing ministers to think again uh, about the position of cases which were referred to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal dismissed them. There's only a, a small number, but the anomaly there is that Parliament has chosen as a matter of policy to apply uh, a broader test uh, as to the relevance of Horizon evidence than the Court of Appeal did in, in the case of Hamilton, which was the leading case. The Court of Appeal said it had to be essential to the prosecution for them to quash the conviction. Parliament has said, has chosen to say, it doesn't have to be essential, just if it was a prosecution that happened in, in a post office capacity whilst Horizon was operating. So anybody who's been convicted since the, the date that this applies to onwards, who worked for the post office uh, and, in some And if they got a Horizon system in operation... That if they got a conviction for something, that, that um, will be overturned. That will be overturned. Even if actually it's nothing to do with Horizon and they were just taking money out of the till. Yes, and, and the, the, the policy decision which Parliament has taken is it's pretty well accepted in English law. You know, there's a maxim that better... Ten guilty men go free, free that one innocent man is convicted. That's a pretty established mm. common law position. There's an acceptance, I think, that some people will be fortunate yes. in consequence of this, but that as against the, the much greater damage that was done, that's a small price to pay. That's not something that concerns me most. What I think would be unfair, if you've got a situation where somebody applied for leave to appeal, the Criminal Cases Review Commission thought it was worth sending to the Court of Appeal, but on the perfectly legitimate at the time test that the Court of Appeal was applying, their conviction wasn't quashed. Someone else, same set of facts, but the Criminal Cases Review Commission thought it wasn't strong enough to go to the Court of Appeal. They'd be exonerated and the person actually thought it was arguable for the Court of Appeal, but lost because of the narrow test. Yeah, and on the basis that, worse off. On the basis that more information has come out about the Post yeah, Office exactly. since those yeah. Court of Appeal cases. Yes, yeah. I understand there was a desire not to trespass on decisions of the judiciary any more than necessary. But I've been persuaded, actually, by that evidence session, I must say, that that would be proper to, to, to treat everybody that way. Alex Chalk used a good phrase, probably we ought to say that everything that when Horizon was operating and the post office prosecuted is, it's all the fruit of the poison tree, mm. uh, and therefore it's all unsaturated. So have we shifted thinking on that? I'd like to think, yes, we have. Have we made a, a worthwhile contribution?
Let's talk about an, another piece of legislation in your area that's generating quite a lot of heat at the moment, and that's the proposal to get rid, essentially, of uh, prison sentences that go for under a year, yeah. which is highly controversial from several points of view. One, the government argues that it's necessary because the prisons are just too crowded and short sentences don't seem to do much good anyway. Two, a lot of your colleagues on the Conservative bank benches think that this is being soft on crime and soft on the causes of crime, to coin a phrase. Where do you stand? I'm very much in favour of what the government's doing. I wish they'd done it sooner. Uh, there is a, a practical political motive that we simply are running out of prison spaces and therefore you've got to make space. Uh, and I don't have a problem with that because you know, prison, let's just take a step back, prison is in, immensely expensive. It's about £47,500 a year mm. uh, to have a person in an adult prison, more if they're in a young offenders institution. Unless society is prepared to put much, much more money than we do at the moment into prisons, that's going to be unsustainable financially, and therefore prison has to be rationed. The logic, therefore, is that prison is for the people who are dangerous, the organised criminals, the violent people, the sexual criminals. Those are the people, anyone would say, they deserve to be inside, and sometimes inside for a long time. But many of the people that get these short sentences, they're certainly a, a wretched nuisance to, let's say, shopkeepers uh, and others, but what underpins it is that their life is chaotic, and that's usually because some other emanation of the state has not picked up on those problems earlier on. The mental health teams didn't pick up on it. Maybe social services didn't when they were kids. Maybe the education system didn't. Uh, other elements of the health service didn't. Housing people didn't. So all of those things are then dumped on the court system and the prison system. So you're quite right, Mark. They don't work effectively because anyone who's been in the system will tell you the three things that give the best opportunity of somebody staying out of trouble, ideally not getting into it to start with, but if, if they've made a mistake of getting back on track, the three things are a job, a roof over their head, and a family or, or relationship. Now, a short sentence all too often disrupts all three of those things. They're going to lose their job, they're going to lose their flat, their girlfriend or boyfriend or partner very often will, will walk away and move on and they come out, the only people they've got to go to are the people they're associating with when they were committing the crimes to start with, and it becomes a vicious circle. But if you don't send them to prison, they presumably will have to be looked after by the probation service and do some kind of community sentence, and the probation service is in no better shape than the prison system, is it? It's not, but in fact investment in the probation service will be less expensive than the costs of running prison. It's not going to cost as much as that 47500 odd a year to fund up the probation service properly, which it does need. And where I'm afraid um, some very ill-judged reforms, by some of my own side, I have to say, put it into a very poor state. We're, we're trying to improve it. But it will be a cheaper and more effective way to do it, to give more resource to probation. And now that we've got you know, all the technology, we've got GPS tags much better, we need to think of better quite tough, actually, sentences in the community. We've got that mixture of punishment. There's nothing wrong with punishment when people have transgressed. But it's got to be also constructive and rehabilitative. And investment in probation and alternatives would make sense economically as well as, I think, socially as well. You've also um, written to the Secretary of State about your concerns, the committee has written about the concerns of the proposals to send foreign prisoners back to overseas prisons to help reduce the, the problems on capacity in UK prisons. You have some concerns about that. Who would go, when, when they would go, you know, uh, I management think of that. I think there's two bits to distinguish here. There's a well-established arrangement for returning foreign national prisoners in the UK to their home countries to serve their sentence. I don't have a problem with that. And ironically, we haven't done anything like as much of that as we might be able to. The idea that caused me concern, and uh, committee of concern, was the thought that we would actually rent space in some prisons to send British prisoners there mm. to relieve the capacity problem. And that's where the concern is about who would you send, how would you square that with your obligations uh, under the ECHR, how would you actually do the rehabilitative work, how would you, for example, start getting them prepared for release? How are you going to get the probation service in to see them and so on? So ECHR, European Convention on Human Rights. Yes, for example, the right to family life, which if they do have family who want to visit them, which is all to be encouraged. How are you going to do that? Yeah, how do you do that if you're in Holland? Mm. The cultural things are different, language issues. And has your committee had a satisfactory response to? The government has been pretty guarded in its response, probably because I think more thoughtful heads in government, if I am frank, 
know that this was a bit of a gimmicky idea that some advisors maybe came up with somewhere. I suspect not in the Ministry of Justice, actually. And that it's not likely to, to, to fly in practice. Okay. Much better to get behind Alex Chalk's idea to take out the short sentence prisoners. And the other thing I'd say we need to do is our other big problem about the pressure on the prison population is the number of people who are on remand awaiting trial. That's gone up nearly 6,000, you know. Yeah. That's grown I mean, that massively. Us, that brings us to another point, though, which, which is we've talked about the prisons being vastly overcrowded. We've talked about the probation service needing to uh, recover from the reforms, in inverted commas, that were made to it a while back. You've also got the courts with massive backlogs in every direction, whether you're talking about the civil courts or the criminal courts. I mean, the justice system as a whole is in a terrible mess right now, isn't it? And presumably nothing much is going to be done about it till after the next election when someone or other is going to have to bite quite a number of bullets. That's right. It is very fragile indeed, and that's me being cautious about the language. It's not something that's entirely new. You know, going back to when I was in practice... Uh, as a barrister, you know, 20, I regret saying, 30 plus years ago, <laughs> it was rocky at times then. And the real problem is that no government, virtually in my professional lifetime, has adequately funded the justice system. Labour governments didn't, arguably, perhaps with the exception of Roy Jenkins, Conservative governments haven't either. And that's unfortunately, when it comes down to crude politics, there aren't any votes in it. Mm. But that does mean that at the moment you've got a situation of it's both a downstream department, so it picks up all a lot of the detritus that's been caused elsewhere in society, and it's also an unprotected department, you know, in, in, in spending terms. That's a very bleak thing to hear, someone who's in charge of monitoring the whole system actually saying that it, it's a backwater, there are no votes in it, because the consequences are so real and so dangerous and could hit almost anybody in society. Absolutely, uh, and that's why one of the things I've tried to do throughout my, my time as chairman is to be blunt about the situation that confronts us and then make the case that if we want, uh, as a civilised society, to have a functioning justice system, we've got to be prepared to put money into it. We've got to be prepared to put money into it wisely. Simply building more prisons, for example, to warehouse people isn't the solution. What you do need to do is to fund the system as a whole. There's a, a little pot, bit of pot of money goes in here, a little bit of pot of money goes in there, often to do a bit of firefighting, but uh, we don't take a, an holistic approach to funding the system. Because as you observe, Mark, they're all interrelated. Delays in the courts create pressures in the prisons. Inadequacy of, of staffing in probation creates both problems for the courts because you don't get a report before you sentence this person. You really need to have reports. Or you don't have the necessary courses done and the necessary resettlement organised for prisoners. You've got to fund the whole lot in a holistic way and in a joined-up fashion. Uh, and you've got, as a society, to say, having a working justice system and we've, we've talked largely around crime, but the same applies, as you fairly observed, Mark, in relation to civil courts too. Having a, a, a readily available and efficient means of individuals resolving their disputes, that's an important part of a civilised society. We ought to say a proper justice system is as much an important social service as having a proper education system. We need to make the case about that. That's what I've tried to do by being pretty forensic, I hope, about exposing the pressures and, and the shortcomings in our system at the moment to try and shake, I'm afraid, um, my colleagues and I think broader society into saying, whether there's votes in it or not, you need this to make it work. Because actually, nobody thinks it will affect them, but one day it does. You've been chair of your committee for, what, just over four years now and, and we're, what, we potentially weeks at most seven months away from a, a general election. One of the things we've picked up about select committees in the last year or so, really, is that they've been struggling to get members to attend. Members are obviously under pressure to do lots more in their constituency. Parliament, the House of Commons, hasn't been operating in the normal way of a sort of three, four-day-a-week parliament. It's almost down to two and a half days, really, in terms of activity when lots of members are present. What's it been like on your committee? Well, the only correction I'm going to say, Ruth, I've been chair of it for nine years. Oh, I became chair just after the 2015 election. Ah. You have to be re-elected at the start of every parliament. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I was, re I was elected in 2015, then re-elected in 17, and then in 19. In fact, there's a, a term limit that means this parliament would be the last I could chair it. It is a problem, I think. I don't think it's unique to the Justice Committee. Inevitably, two things happen in the course of a parliament, particularly if it's been a fairly long-running one. It's become more or less running its term. There's a lot of churn on select committees because mm. you'll start off with quite a few new members and they'll be ambitious and some of them will get jobs 
You know, when I started off in 2015, we had two bright young Tory members, Alex Chalk and Victoria Prentice, uh, <laughs> on the select committee. Went on to higher things. Yeah, went on to, went on to higher things in the, in, in the law. You lose them because they get jobs. Same as, yeah, my very good Labour colleague, uh, Maria Eagle, has now been promoted to the opposition front bench. And as I think you get nearer to the election, people worry more about their constituency, start looking over their shoulder. And some people are less willing, particularly if their seats are marginal, Hmm. to be prepared to commit the time that you do need so that you've got consistent attendance uh, and that you can actually do the preparation. Because, you know, hmm. um, I always treat the select committee a bit as I did when a barrister, you know. You only cross-examine well if, if you've prepared well. You've got to mug up the brief, and that does take a bit of commitment. Hmm. So I think it's probably a function of the latter end of a parliament and the fact that we've had this revolving door uh, of people coming on the committee, being really keen, get jobs, and then when they're an ex-minister or ex-front bench, and maybe there's other things have then come along that, that, that engage their interests. I think we'll leave it there, Sir Bob. Thank you very much for joining us on the pod. Pleasure. Delighted to do so. Sir Bob Neil. Well, Ruth, just before we go, time to deal with a few questions we've had put in by listeners. Uh, take it away. Yeah, so we've had one from Keith Clarity, who says, hypothetically, what would happen if the Prime Minister's party retained a parliamentary majority but the Prime Minister lost their seat. Would that trigger a new leadership race? And then he goes on to say, love the show and eagerly await every new episode. Thank you for this wonderful podcast. So thank you, Keith, for those very kind words. Glad you're enjoying it. So, Mark, a bit of a constitutional conundrum. <laughs> well, I think the first thing to say is it's quite difficult to imagine the circumstances where a party simultaneously wins an election but loses its leader. I suppose it's not impossible, but it seems yeah. improbable. But if it did happen... What then? Um, there wouldn't be time or it wouldn't be very convenient for a party to have a full-dress leadership race with hustings around the country in a stately process taking six weeks or something before they came up with a new leader because any incoming government wants to hit the ground running. Any newly re-elected government wants to get on with its agenda. So that would be a bit awkward. So I've been, I've been racking my brains for kind of historical precedents here. A.J. Balfour, who was the Conservative leader in the run-up to the 1907 six Liberal landslide, he'd actually stopped being Prime Minister shortly before and the Liberals had taken over and immediately called a general election. A.J. Balfour lost his seat, but in those days elections were somewhat different in the way they were conducted to what happens now, and he had time to do a quick soft shoe shuffle to another constituency and quickly make himself the candidate there <laughs> and get elected back to the Commons, so he didn't almost didn't miss a beat. But it misses the point that you're raising here because he wasn't Prime Minister and he wasn't going to be Prime Minister anyway. A bit more recently, not all that much more recently, there was the situation where Sir Alec Douglas Hume, as he then wasn't, was a peer, was chosen as Conservative leader, taking over from Harold Macmillan in the early 60s, and had to renounce his peerage, something that was made possible by Tony Benn, curiously <laughs> enough, but that's another story. He renounced his peerage and then had to fight a by-election to get into the Commons. Now, he was Conservative leader, he was kind of Prime Minister in waiting, but what would have happened if he hadn't won that by-election? I imagine there would have had to have been some other quick leadership election then. Actually, leadership election isn't quite the right phrase, because in those days the Conservatives didn't elect their leader. They emerged from what uh, was rather scathingly described by Ian McLeod, I think, as mm. the magic circle process. So it could all have happened quite quickly, but someone else would have had mm. to have been found to take mm. up the reins at that point. Mm. And they, doubtless, would forever have been described as their party's second choice. Yeah. It's a bit of a millstone to have around your neck. So there isn't an exact historical precedent no, here that we can grope for. No. I mean, I think if you sort of... Think about the constitutional principles. The party leader does not have to be prime minister and vice versa. And also the monarch, the sovereign, must not be without a constitutional advisor. So there has to be a prime minister appointed. So if the prime minister of the day lost his or her seat, but their party got back in, then I think you'd be in the scenario where what the party did would be up to them in terms of choosing the party leader. That would be a separate track of activity for the party to resolve. But the cabinet, or the previous cabinet, if, assuming that they were, how, however many of them had got back in, 
they would in effect have to decide from within their ranks and within their number who they would essentially propose to the sovereign should take over as, as prime minister. And you could imagine that the private secretary to the sovereign at that point would be spending rather a lot of time on the phone finding yes. out what was going on yes. so that this could all be done as seamlessly as possible and hopefully yeah. without the sovereign having to make an actual choice. Yes. Yeah, there'd have to be some very, very rapid movement to try and get someone in place to serve as prime minister on the principle that the king or the queen's government has to be carried on so it would all have to move pretty damn fast yes and they'd have to be able to then command the confidence of the house so you'd you'd be into the state opening of parliament to confirm that indeed the choice and the whatever they had managed to cobble together did indeed uh, have the requisite level of support yeah and if your party turned out not to entirely support you then we're really off to the races (laughs) and probably another another general election i mean there have been people who suggested that there ought to be a formal vote of confidence in a new government at the start of a new parliament just to sort of set things in stone Mm. a bit but uh, we don't normally quite do that in in a sense the vote on the king's speech is the closest you come to that and, and that's usually a pretty done deal yeah So moving on, we've had another question from Barnaby Jackson. He asked a question about Rwanda and about something that Sir Robert Buckland has said on another podcast. um, There are other podcasts? There are are others, and I confess, Mark, I appeared on it with Sir Robert Buckland last week. Shocked, shocked, I say. It was a temporary uh, temporary, uh, appearance. So I'm not going to get into the details of that, because, I I mean, we'd have to replay Sir Robert's uh, words to get into what Barnaby was asking about that. But he does say that... um, how can anyone deem Rwanda a safe country now and forever just because of assurances that risks are not just mitigated but eliminated? Well, that's not really a Parliament Matters podcast-type question because it's not really about Parliament. It's more a sort of a policy issue. But what we have talked about, of course, on the podcast is these are exactly the kinds of issues that the House of Lords were raising during the debate and exactly the kind of concerns that they had. Yes, and, and if you go back and look at the Lords debates, you can see, for example, Lord Anderson of Ipswich, David Anderson, mm. a crossbench peer, thundering away on this very point and proposing a mechanism to underpin this whole issue of whether Rwanda's safe or not. There'd be a committee that would advise a Secretary of State on whether it was. But the government has absolutely refused to accept and it's been rejected several times by the Commons and now the Rwanda Bill is law without any such mechanism within it. So mm. Parliament has deemed Rwanda to be safe and that's it right up to the moment when someone decides to change that. Yeah, and the other element, of course, is that there's also a treaty with Rwanda that the government has now chosen to ratify. Again, without agreeing to what the House of Lords wanted, which was debate on that before they did so. So there we are. We've also had a more a suggestion rather than a question from Nick Walker, who I think may be a former House of Commons clerk, I'm not sure, but... Um He says, very much enjoying your podcast. Before we get into a general election campaign or a conservative leadership campaign, depending on the result, I was wondering whether you'd be able to have the leader and shadow leader on separate editions to explain their plans, if any, for reform of the Commons and perhaps the Lords if they win the election. Perhaps also the Lib Dems and the SNP spokespeople for their thoughts as well. Well, To quote the song in My Fair Lady, wouldn't it be lovely? Yes, I mean, it would be would be great. And it's something, Nick, that we have talked about. And one of the, the issues is, is obviously getting key players to be willing to say something on the record that's meaningful and interesting. <laughs> Um, and there's a kind of uh, a sort of a reluctance to put much uh, much flesh on the bone of their ideas and thoughts at this particular moment in time. Yeah, it's um, my, my long-standing gripe that however much oppositions complain about using the full power of government to tank legislation through, as soon as those oppositions pupate and emerge from their chrysalis as governments, they do all the things that they would been complaining about before in their previous incarnation. So uh, they're always very careful not to foreclose the option. Yeah, but in the interest of transparency, Mark, I should perhaps say that um, I mean I've had a couple of meetings with Lucy Powell the shadow leader of the House of Commons uh, so the Labour spokesperson in the last couple of weeks you know talking about things like delegated legislation our proposals for for reform talking about legislation improving legislative process and so on and the mood music is positive good you know they're in listening mode thinking about what they want to do but we'll have to wait and see what their plans crystallise as. I'll keep our fingers crossed. And with that, Ruth, I think we've reached the end of this particular podcast. We'll be back next week, doubtless, to discuss the aftermath of those local elections. Indeed. See you next week. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. 
please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Hansard Society.